All righty, so uh, it's time to kick off. I'd like to welcome everybody um, on behalf of SABSA to the second in the Perspectives webinar series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about success in the low-touch economy. I think quite a good topic. Uh, my name is John, I'll be your MC. I'm just here to kind of uh, glue it all together, um, but I'm not going to waste too much time uh, with any formalities. Uh, today is a very uh, um, narrow and specific uh, subject, I think highly relevant to where a lot of people's heads are at at the moment. So that's good. Um, and I hope we can, uh, we can get through the formality stuff and get straight to our speaker who has got a, a fantastic CV and has done amazing work on this very topic. So uh, it should be good. Uh, I'm looking forward to quite a robust discussion. We'll try and get through everything um, so that we can get to Q&A and keep this as interactive as possible um, as quickly as we can. So I'm going to try and keep timing uh, to give our, our guest speaker, Nick, as much time as we can and give you some time at the end. Also remember, if you've got questions or anything to add or reflect on or ask, put it in the chat uh, if you can, and then we'll get to that or the Q&A. And we will, I will make sure that we cover as many of those as we can uh, in the time that we have. So uh, without much further ado, I thought it'd be good uh, to formally open this, somebody who's qualified, uh, to open this webinar, um, the Dean and Director of Henley uh, Business School Africa, and uh, and also um, the co-chair um, at SAPSA, uh, Professor John Foster Pedley. Thank you, and I, I feel I'm on a very tight time whip here, so I shall try not to talk so fast to get so much in. But thank you very much, John, for that introduction, um, and welcome to everybody who are joining now. I see people are, are coming in all the time. Um, why is this important? Um, it's really important because we've been facing COVID for five or six months now, and it's not going to go away for another year or two, probably. And we're going to be living under a, a different economy and different conditions. So um, all the businesses, all the organizations, everybody is going to be living in what we might call a low touch economy or distance economy. Um, how do we do that? We can busk it or we can jump around or we can get excited or we can be methodical, clear, intellectually clear and process wise uh, organized. And Nick DeMay from Board of Innovation has been inspiring me and many other people with his uh, colleague, Philippe. Uh, they live there in Antwerp. They're a wonderful international organization working with great companies. They've been able to articulate how to do this both operationally and in terms of business models, in terms of strategy, better than anyone else I know. We're very privileged that Nick's being able to join us. And um, we are going to be listening very carefully. And I'd like to hand over now to the chair of uh, SABSA, the South African Business Schools Organization, Professor Randall Jonas, who is, um, I know, even more inspired to help business schools and businesses around the country and around Africa to, to manage under these circumstances. So over to you, Randall. Many thanks, John, uh, for those charming words. And thank you very much, John, Christmas for introducing us to this very, very important webinar today. This is the second in the series for SAPSA, and we really aim to share information and expertise with a range of our stakeholders because we feel it's so important, particularly in today's world, the, uh, the pandemic world, that has been touched by so many problems in the world of employment and economies that are suffering as a result of it. So the low-touch economy and the success behaviors is quite a pertinent and a very, very topical matter for us to discuss and we brought Nick to the collaboration of SAPSA and Henley Business School to talk to us today how businesses can rebound and recover in a low-touch economy. What are those success behaviors that will make them survive the pandemic? And that also what will it entail to re to recalibrate actually their business models for the so-called new normal. So SAPSA really aims therefore to improve its recognition in, as an organization representing business schools, but more importantly, to be that catalyst for, for very important dialogue and discussion around problems that are face, we are facing in society and particularly in business, and how we can share uh, top class thought leadership such as the ones that will be brought by Nick DeMay today to our audiences. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'm going to hand you over now to John Christmas. Thank you very much, John. And we're looking forward to an exciting discussion today. All the best, Nick. Thank you. John, you're on mute. 
Thank you very much. It's the new plague, right? At Henley, we have a, we have a running joke. You're on mute is our new mantra. Uh, it's the space bar. But that's the way it should. Um, but before we bring Nick on, just quickly, uh, um, for those who are um, hearing of Nick for the first time, or the Board of Innovation for the first time, I think it's really important to note that when you do uh, look at the material being produced by the Board of Innovation, uh, what strikes you immediately is how crisp and how absolutely applicable the information is almost immediately. There's so many of these webinars at the moment telling people what to do in this time, but so few of them get to the point so quickly. So it's really great to have you in. And I did notice in our rehearsal, Nick, that that's how you like to operate, very fast, only the useful information, and we move forward. So without much further ado, uh, over to Nick DeMay. Nick, thanks for joining us. Great. Uh, thanks for your introduction. Let me already share my screen so people can uh, follow along. So one second. So like this, so that should uh, work. Yes, great. I think we're all uh, set and ready to go. Uh, so yes, I'll, I'll take some time here to uh, explain the low touch economy and uh, the full story. Um, at, uh, also I want to make sure you will get all the slides. So we'll get a full export of all the material that I will share in this presentation. So there's no need to take a screenshot of every single slide. There might be a lot of information in here. Uh, so at the end, I'll make sure everybody will get uh, the full content. And I'll assume also you, you might get access to the full recording uh, as well. So I need like the Board of Innovation. I'm one of the founders of the Board of Innovation. We're a strategy and business design firm, mainly focused on helping uh, large multinationals and big corporates with their uh, biggest innovation challenges. Uh, we have offices today in New York, Amsterdam, Antwerp, and Singapore. So we have this very ambitious uh, mission always to uh, share what we create, share tools. So we want to inspire 100 million people to innovate for a better tomorrow. So participating in these type of webinars uh, definitely fits with our uh, long-term mission to share all this uh, material. So in this, uh, uh, in this story, I'll explain, I give a quick introduction in what we define as the low-touch economy and why uh, we believe uh, this will be here to stay for a relative uh, long time. Uh, I'll talk about winners in the low touch economy. So what makes certain companies a little bit more successful? Uh, a couple of examples on how you can uh, go forward. And uh, briefly at the end, I'll talk about a couple of opportunities or white spaces, uh, as a couple of recommendations of what you can do uh, with your business or organization to go forward in uh, the, next, uh, the next era. Second here. Yes. And at the end, hopefully there, was, there, is, uh, there will be some time for Q&A. Uh, so if you have specific questions, uh, you can already drop them in chat or at the end of the conversation, we can have a discussion on that as well. So talking about the, the feedback loop of, loop of the low touch economy. So when we talk about the low touch economy, uh, of course, it starts with all the different uh, health measures and the restrictions that were uh, put on us due to the pandemic itself. But our main focus has always been on the, the challenges that, that are happening on the, the economy side. So there's a lot of economic disruption ongoing. This, there's also feedback loop in terms of uh, behavior shifts. So consumers are behaving differently. People are behaving differently in society. So the way consumers and companies are interacting with each other is a little bit disrupted at this moment. And we don't think that that will return anytime uh, soon. So depending on how people behave, this will of course also influence how the pandemic will play out. So there's this interesting feedback loop between those two, between, between those uh, three areas. We try to monitor what's going on already for a couple of months now. Um, and to define that uh, new economy, we coined the term low touch economy because it will be a, an economy defined by a lot of changes in uh, how we interact with companies and business. I think we all experience that in our day-to-day -day, uh, lives now. Uh, we see a lot of uh, new disinfecting stations. We see new type of vehicles. We see cities that are being redesigned with new bike lanes to give more space to people. Uh, robots appearing in hotels or in hospitality contexts. Um, we even saw robots patrolling in Singapore to uh, patrol for uh, social distancing. Um, we see virtual weddings, uh, a new type of informal, uh, new social gatherings where there's a hybrid solution between uh, digital and offline interaction. So basically a lot of experiments are ongoing. Some are just uh, here to stay for a relative uh, uh, short time during the strict lockdowns. Other things are here to stay for a longer time. Um, definitely when it, it's in the context of uh, larger events, larger gatherings. So you see, depending on the region where you're based, things are going up and down. 
I'm personally I'm based in Antwerp, Central Europe, in Belgium. Uh, we are talking about our second wave. If you go to Hong Kong, they're talking about the third wave already. Uh, and if you look at the US, they're still more or less waiting in this very long extended first wave. So you will see, I will, will all see that depending on the region, the, the pandemic plays out differently and also how businesses and companies respond to those different measures. So it's not just a one size fits all solution, depending on the region or the context, you'll have to behave differently or adapt your strategy in a different way. So big, the, the, the number one question we get at the moment is, okay, when will this uh, be over? And most of the time linked to, okay, will the, will the vaccine uh, matter in the end? Um, of course, that will also, if I look back, maybe a couple of months ago, early April, early, early May, uh, I was a little bit more positive about the, the influence about having a vaccine available. Uh, I think we changed our position a little bit in the last few uh, months now. Um, you see that at least there are, there are so many vaccines on, ongoing in production. So you see AstraZeneca and Mora companies are in their third um, trial phases already, meaning they might go to market relatively soon compared to other vaccine developments. Russia is was already pushing forward and trying to distribute coronavirus already from next month on. Uh, but at the same time, you see uh, uh, rising tensions around uh, people that are uh, opposing against, uh, going against the vaccine. So they're not trying, like you see in the US or in, um, uh, in Brittany, uh, in England, where you see at least almost 50% of people are not willing to uh, easily to, to get that vaccine. So there's more resistance. There's a lot of mistrust in government. So you also see it will not be an easy uh, solution. So even if their vaccine will be available and even if you get it distributed, it will be a quick fix for our society and, and the economy. So um, I'm a little bit more reluctant to see this as a quick win here. It will be, um, it will be uh, a, step, a step in the right direction, but it will not be as easy as I expected maybe to be in uh, the last uh, few months. So unfortunately, the, many of the ripple effects, so it's not just the pandemic itself, but uh, the impact on our society, the impact on the overall economy, that will be here to stay for uh, a longer time. So even if we have the solution available for the pandemic, there will be so much disruption in the economy and how people behave or people adapted in a, in a different way. So that we will feel for a longer uh, time. Um, maybe a question uh, to you already. So you all should have access to chat. Uh, so if you go to the chat, uh, if you can quickly answer, so in your region, what do you think for which industry might be uh, last to fully recover? Um, so it really depends on the context or region or the domain you're in. But if you look around, which industry you think will, will take a very long time uh, to recover now? Uh, if you reply in chat, make sure to select all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, you're only, only answering to me. Um, so try to answer it, make check, check checkbox. I see a couple of people are replying only to me. So um, the checkbox, all panelists and attendees, then you're replying to the, everyone who's following. So I see people here, of course, tourism, hospitality. Um, you see that governments are pushing really hard to uh, restart tourism. Many regions are impacted a lot. You see uh, regions like Japan, we're even bidding to, to pay tourists to get uh, back to, uh, to Japan. Um, Education, very, very good point. Education, we have a lot of um, debate about that because uh, depending on the age, like the younger kids, um, luckily the, the virus is not as uh, impactful or negative impactful for those kids. So most of the time education for younger kids is recovering quite soon or very quickly, but older education, uh, older for older generations like uh, 20 year olds or even talent development in large corporates, that's now moving fully to hybrid solutions. So indeed it will take a relative long time uh, to see a full recovery there. Other good examples need like fashion, fashion and then many parts of retail might be disrupted as well for a longer time. Feel free to share more of those uh, uh, replies in chat already. So overall, we'll expect a slow and bumpy uh, recovery. Based on our feedback, uh, we did different surveys, like this is based on a feedback survey from uh, 750 people in multiple organizations and in multiple industries. Uh, Already for 2020, only 15% of those companies expect to see a positive return this year. So there are, of course, some companies that are doing quite well, even in those uh, these difficult times, but other companies are severely hit. Um, luckily, many of the comp I, we already assume that many companies will find a solution and will get back to a more positive result next year. 
it doesn't mean that it will be fully recovered, but companies are adapting, are switching to new products and services. Uh, but it's a, it's a very uh, asymmetrical um, outcome. So that some companies will stay at this very low, impactful, negative uh, feedback loops. Other companies might find a solution or might even thrive in the ex exceptional profit margins. So it's a very strange uh, situation now where you see that some companies are doing quite well and other companies are impacted for a relatively long time in it, like tourism, hospitality, and maybe some uh, education companies. A recent survey uh, consulted CEOs of, of large companies to see, okay, when you think you will see a full recovery in your organization, and this, uh, you see that the, the timing evolves. Like if we ask similar questions, look at results uh, early on in, in March, April, then many people were still hoping that by summer we'll see a full recovery, or at least we have get a better view on, on relative soon recovery. But when, once we hit it summer or close to summer, most organizations realize, okay, this is here for a relative long time. This is not a quick fix. So you see that in those polls as well, like uh, already many CEOs look at almost 60% looks at the full recovery for 2022. So Q1, 2022, and only 30% almost uh, one year later, 2023. And this is, of course, this is just across many different industries. There might be industries like uh, tourism and hospitality might even take a longer time to go to full pre-pandemic uh, levels. So it helps also to look at uh, different regions uh, globally, because every region um, has a different culture, a different way to approach the pandemic and different way to re help in the recovery of the economy. Uh, if you look at overall the numbers of uh, the Chinese economy, where of course the pandemic started, you see that uh, luckily in, the, in many of the parts of that region, the many pointers in the overall economy are already back, back at pre-pandemic levels. Uh, so that's interesting to see like this, it's, uh, but it's, it's very asymmetrical. So you see that it's back at pre-pandemic levels, but it's not as expected. If you look at the numbers last year, 2019, we're not back at that level, but, but at least back at the uh, economic status of early January. But uh, China and uh, certain Asian regions have a very different approach on how to handle the pandemic, also culturally, like wearing masks or following certain guidelines or doing for far more invasive tracking and tracing. Uh, many of those measures that might help with the pandemic are not, um, uh, there's not a good fit with many cultures uh, in other parts of the world. So many regions will have a slower recovery due to that. Uh, and of course, the economy, the different situation in each region might be different. Uh, so China is not always the best uh, context to compare, but it's interesting to see that all across the board in many points are showing that we're already back at pre-pandemic pre levels here. But again, it's uneven. If you look at numbers for tourism on the, on the left here, different regions, you see that many touristic spots are still very low. The numbers on the right here showing how retail is recovering. Very gradually, retail is recovering in different countries. Uh, there are many of those charts available. So the, I, I added the source at the bottom here. The Financial Times is doing a great job today to keep track of multiple regions and different industries. So there are good websites here to track what's going on. And depending on the region that you're in or depending on the industry, it helps to um, uh, it helps to look at uh, the different uh, companies. I need to try to slow down a little bit. Sorry, uh, um, sometimes I'm a little bit too enthusiastic. Thanks for sharing that in the chat. So what's also interesting to follow is that in terms of recovery, uh, we were talking about the V-shaped recovery, L-type of recovery. Um, the, the fact is that certain areas of our industry are recovering quite well. So uh, certain industries are having a better fit, let's say, with the digital economy or people, people like us, where uh, we can restart or re re continue doing what we do just remotely via video conferencing and all those tools. But many of us, uh, it might give, give a different view on reality because many people, they are working in, in hospitals, in retail, in factories. Uh, it's quite difficult to get back at pre-pandemic levels. You can't just switch to digital solutions. So we have a lot of conversations with companies like insurance companies and so on, and that we're debating about new strategies. But of course, we're biased because many of us are working in a situation that we, that we can use modern tools to restart. So you see that there's a great article in the Wall Street Journal recently uh, showing that certain parts of the economy are actually rising again. But unfortunately, there's a big rise in inequality. Um, the biggest impact can be felt by minority groups. And they were often working in other parts of industries that are affected more by the pandemic. So unfortunately, there will be some sort of K-shaped recovery. And I can follow that uh, way of thinking where certain companies are doing well, but then certain people in that community will have a very uh, tough time to recover 
and might take years for them to get back. So let's have a closer look at some of the winners and companies that, that they were doing uh, better. Um, so we always try to see how can you adapt to that new environment. So if you want to become part of that group of winners, what defines those winners and what can you learn from those organizations? So uh, we try to keep track of winners. So again, you will get a slide, but there's a public um, sort of a dashboard now that we, where we keep track of uh, companies that are doing better. So meaning they have positive returns, they're adapted to this new normal already, and they're thriving even in this uh, era. So there are multiple categories that you can define. And we excluded one big category. There's a big category that's doing really well at the moment. All companies that are linked to life sciences, pharma companies, of course, they're doing better. They're, they're selling masks, they're selling maybe vaccines or treatments already. Um, so they're in a great position and overall they're doing well, but we excluded them from the list. If you look at other companies that are doing well, we see multiple categories emerging. Uh, there's a big category with what you could link uh, up to digital infrastructure. So companies are, that are uh, helping with automation or communication, so those things. On the right here, there's a category, anything to low touch living. That's interesting to follow here. So there are companies that are um, providing solutions for companies to restart. So they're offering uh, facility management services with uh, new gates and uh, procedures to uh, enter buildings, but also safer living at home. Uh, E-commerce solutions also fits to that lifestyle, like what's a low touch lifestyle and companies that can help out here. Uh, maybe a third one that I want to highlight, uh, the bottom left here, uh, there's a category which we would cluster um, investing in yourself. So people, even in the pandemic, during the lockdowns or when they're, they feel locked at home, uh, they, they can't travel, but they still want to invest in themselves. So the meaning they, they might invest in a healthier lifestyle. So you see a lot of um, sports related uh, tools uh, or services that are growing. You see people are companies like L'Oreal uh, providing makeup, even they are doing well. Companies that are selling sort of personal treats or even uh, online courses and training, people investing in themselves to become a better person. Again, you see a big rise in that category as well. So on the last one, maybe here to highlight, disconnecting from reality, anything linked to entertainment, gaming, gambling. Uh, people want to get away from a, a very hectic environment out there and companies that are in that domain are of course uh, still growing. Uh, so interesting to see the different split. If we analyze companies, and this is an exercise you can do as well with your own team or the people that you work with on your strategy, is uh, it's not just looking at different companies from a brand name and quick offering, but if in the low touch economy where you see different categories, so different characteristics of companies that are doing better. Um, so you need to look at the audience. So some people are working with, let's say with elderly people traditionally, uh, that's a high risk group at the moment. So you need to adapt and move away from that target group. It might be very difficult to engage with them in a personal way. Some companies are linked to offline solutions only. So the location, how to interact with people, you might not be able to switch to virtual solutions. Uh, maybe sometimes your impact on the on the bottom here on, on the supply chain level. Many supply chains are disrupted globally, are under pressure. So basically, this is sort of a checklist where uh, you can evaluate the low touch potential of an organization. Uh, in this deck already, we included a couple of examples, and there's more uh, more of those examples that you can download as a reference point. So if you look at look at one of the winners, or companies are doing well. Um, a company like Peloton offering in-home gym equipment via digital uh, courses and classes. That's of course a company that's perfectly designed for this uh, low touch era. Uh, of course you do fitness and guidance uh, at home. It's actually targeted at a very uh, high end part of the market. So luxury consumers, uh, the bike itself is, is almost service more than $2,000. You get an, a subscription service per month uh, for up to 50, $60. Uh, but during the, in even the pandemic, they realized that there's a whole other market segment that they can address. So also, even those companies that are doing well are also adapting their offering, moving to new kind of services, moving to free services on via Apple TV or, or uh, offering service solutions without renting the bike itself. So you see those companies are, they are in great position. They cover a lot of those checklists and still they're innovating in that space. I want to highlight this example as well because it's not the most obvious example that you might uh, look at. Uh, this is a, uh, one of the many startups or companies in, that are offering uh, meat uh, alternatives, so vegan solutions, plant-based solutions for meat. The reason why those companies are also quite successful or growing today 
is mainly linked to uh, disruption that are happening in the supply chain. So it's sort of a ripple effect in society. Many of the meat factories or meat plants are under pressure. Uh, they have a lot, there are a lot of outbreaks in, of, in terms of the pandemic in those facilities. So some, in certain regions, uh, there are difficulties to provide enough meat to customers. So if you offer an alternative to meat, you see companies that, that are active in the space are actually able uh, to grow. And again, the same company is still experimenting, trying to find new pricing solutions, trying to find uh, new ways to access markets. Uh, so it's not just about uh, uh, e-commerce itself or the, the most obvious solutions. You also see companies that are maybe further down in the value chain that see positive returns now due to the ripple effects uh, in, our, in our society. As a recommendation here, we uh, advise to use a quick checklist like this to evaluate your readiness for the low-touch economy to see on all those elements, how are we doing today? Are we all aligned in our own team? If you need to evaluate your strategy and it's a good starting point for discussion to go forward to maybe re adapt your strategy at some point. So again, a qu quick question to you and you can reply in the chat. Uh, have you adapted your strategy already? So depending on the context or region, some people didn't uh, change their strategy so far, other made significant shifts. So did you change your strategy? And if you change your strategy, some companies are uh, launching new products and services, looking for external growth. Other companies are, fo are focusing their strategy on defending what they have today, like defending the core business, defending the products they already have, and maybe doubling down on that. So you all see a split. Uh, I'm curious to see uh, like if you can reply in chat, what are you doing at the moment? Are you changing your strategy, yes or no? And if you're changing your strategy, are you defending or investing in new growth areas by launching new products and services and maybe looking for new markets? Out there, so it really depends on the on the industry. You see a big split here in how we're doing. So I see a couple of examples here in chat. Um, so some in need are saying we're, we're defending. Some are switching 100% to from face to face to virtual facilitation. Some in need are launching uh, new products. Products. So we see a very uh, big split. So it's not a one. It's not a one common strategy. In one of our recent surveys that we did, uh, if you look at the left side here, those are relatively small organizations compared to the large companies on the right side. And then the biggest shift here is that you see that the, the largest companies out there are mainly shifting their strategy to protect the core business, so to, to, to defend what they have. Uh, while if you look at smaller organizations, many of them are impacted sooner or they have a limited offering, so they need to change and find a new direction. So you see that smaller companies are uh, moving to more, more to shifting, shifting to adjacent spaces by trying new products, by trying new, new services. So you see a, a different mindset in terms of innovation efforts. Um, so depending on the company that we work with, you, we might focus on improving the core business today, while a relatively small company, uh, there might be an opportunity now to find new growth areas outside of the core business and try new products, new services, new business models. So it's not a one-off uh, solution, it really depends on, on the context. Very quickly, this model in terms of how uh, companies are evolving. We started, pre-pandemic, we started with uh, the top right corner, where like you uh, interacted with your customers in a high touch way, in many, depending on the industry, but you close personal physical interactions with customers or employees, and you were able to provide high value, to top, eh, like on value for high value. Of course, the pandemic forced everyone or many organizations in the bottom left corner uh, where you only had low touch interactions. And unfortunately, in the first few weeks, low touch value as well, or low value for the customer. So many companies shifted in the first few weeks and months to have a quick, quick, quick fix. So, okay, it was not enough to, have, uh, to get back at pre-pandemic levels, to get back at the same value proposition where companies are moving up again. Uh, unfortunately, in many regions, there are still restrictions in place. There are certain, there's a certain area where you can't interact in the same way as you did before. So there will be certain restrictions in place in terms of number of people that you can interact with or how you can interact with individual people or certain people you can't even access at all. So there's a sort of upper limit on the interaction model, how you can interact with people. So you see a lot of those improvised solutions where companies are trying to restart but you just feel like this is not an optimal solution. It, it, people don't feel safe in that context. It's a, um, it's a, it's some often very inconvenient way. So companies are trying to adapt, and it might be a temporary solution, but it's not a full recovery. And uh, you see the same thing in event spaces or in uh, festivals, uh, entertainment business. Companies are moving to online solutions to create virtual festivals, virtual events. 
but most of the time it's not the same. So it's just a temporary thing, but many realize it's not profitable, it's not good enough. And unfortunately in this, this space, they really need to change to a very new type of business model because this might not be possible in the next, like a full recovery in the next uh, two, three years. Even. So getting back up that high level here with this restriction place might be really hard. Uh, but some are doing even better than before. And then there are in certain restaurant businesses or certain areas, you see that companies due to the pandemic, they were forced uh, to a, a hybrid solution of providing customers in an offline context, still with tables and extra terraces outside, but at the same time now fully adopting digital solutions with uh, migrating in the backend, virtual kitchens, cloud kitchens, so all sorts of experiments accessing new type of markets as well. And some companies will stay in that new hybrid mode where instead of only offering an offline restaurant experience, they will keep on providing this mixed solution with cloud services and virtual kitchens and remote deliveries and, and so on. So it depends on the, on the context, but some companies are here. Other companies are moving completely to this low touch version now. So they, they learn something new, they learn they can op offer virtual solutions, digital solutions, and they might just abandon their, the, the old way of working and stick to this low touch version of this uh, business. You see that companies uh, that are providing tools to help out, like uh, tools to go direct to consumers uh, by getting payments directly from fans, from uh, members. So, so you see also tools that are designed for that solution to, um, get a new to build new relationship with customers uh, remotely those platforms are thriving uh, like only fans is one of the bigger uh, stars at the moment uh, it started as a service um, like if you, you would be a yoga instructor online uh, yoga instructor you could use a platform where people would pay you a, a certain fee so you can give, give private yoga classes uh, but one of the biggest rises, it's a, the biggest boost now is growing from uh, adult entertainment. So it's a, you don't see a lot of talk about uh, that. So it's officially, you see it as more like a way to connect with uh, yoga stars uh, and so on. But in the back end, many people are using it for other type of purposes as well. Other platforms like Patreon, Substack, Memberful are less focused on adult entertainment, but just the same type of solution, get building relationships directly to customers via digital channels. And those platforms are, of course, uh, rising today. As a last topic here, I quickly want to highlight a couple of uh, those things. So one, if you're in a tough position and you need to find new white spaces, new opportunities, uh, where do you start? Uh, we always advise to look at, to look at uh, three, uh, six different uh, areas. So looking at changes in uh, shifts in the industry overall, shifts in regulation, uh, shifts in consumer behavior, societal shifts, and so on. Uh, in this specific situation, though, this specific crisis, we see that the biggest opportunities now are happening in terms of uh, industry shifts. So meaning there are new entrants entering uh, new markets. You see companies that are creating new partnerships. Uh, companies need to rethink what their industry is all about. So this, there's a lot of stuff happening in, in, in different industries. And there's a lot of shifts happening in consumer behavior where people are adopting a new lifestyle. People are getting used to new habits. That of course creates new opportunities or potential new problems that could be solved by our company. Uh, also, depending on the region or context, uh, changes in regulation is quite prominent. So if you look at the insurance business or life sciences um, area, uh, in a, on a very uh, short time frame, a uh, lot of regulations or policies were updated to allow uh, reimbursement of certain fees or to change to remote work and to still be compliant in a certain context. So the, there are a lot of opportunities in that space. We put the category of new technology at the on the low end, because this, this pandemic here, it didn't suddenly create a lot of new technologies. It's a lot of, because there was a pandemic, suddenly there are a lot, a lot of new patents out there or a lot of new tools. But you see now gradually in the space of technology, uh, new startups are, are uh, trying new solutions. So technology will be enabled for growth, but it was not the reason why you will see a lot of new growth opportunities out there. So, um, in each of those areas, we already defined multiple solutions or multiple opportunities as a source of inspiration to see okay, what can happen in that space. Um, we have more of those examples uh, for each of those areas in the different reports. You can just download those reports on uh, lowtoucheconomy.com and just use it in, within your own organization as a source of inspiration. I just want to, as a, a closing note here, as a, I want to discuss briefly three different opportunity areas but I believe that in the next few months and then in the year ahead 
can be really valuable to multiple uh, organizations. So if you want more material, you of course can look at the report, but those are three highlights that I want to uh, briefly discuss. Um, overall, and this is not just purely linked to the, the pandemic itself, but this is one of the ripple effects. Um, trust in institutions and organizations and even businesses is at historic low levels. That's, you see that happening all over the place. Like a company, uh, many consumers are uh, looking at uh, fake news even. There are a lot of conspiracy theories, theories uh, thriving today. Um, so you, there are just a lot of indications that trust in society and institutions is, is, is so low. But as an organization or as a company, it also creates opportunities. You can tap into that need. You can uh, create new services that offer transparency or you can offer more transparency in, um, in your supply chain. Like we're talking a lot about companies about improving their uh, sustainability design and being involved in the circular economy. Uh, so that means you need to offer, you want to create more transparency in your production process and how your factories work, how you engage your employees. But this, of course, is in line with tackling that trust issue that exists in uh, society. Uh, also, in terms of creating new services that are linked to reliability or risk control, like insurances, those tools or those services are actually designed or optimal for this uh, new uh, new era. Trust is quite low, so if you have any type of solution that can tap into this, you're in a great position maybe for growth uh, next year. A second uh, big topic that's also, that's a little bit related to the trust issue. You just see like uh, overall, the society for many people is getting too complex. Like the pandemic is even on top, but it creates tension in their work life environment. They're reading so much negative news about also the impact of climate change. And there's this continuous feed of uh, negative news that's happening for, and uh, it imp impacts uh, people's, people's lives on so many different elements. So the world's getting very complex for many people. So you see rising tensions, the rise of nationalism in many regions. Um, again, the sp spreading of, of fake news and conspiracy theories, it's all linked to the same core uh, uh, issue of the world, that the world is getting too complex for many people. But of course, again, that's an opportunity for you as an organization. If you can tap into this, you can create solutions that offer more simplicity or more convenience that helps them offloading stress, even if it's just a solution to maybe help them make certain decisions or to help them with, to escape from it all. So like I, I talked about uh, entertainment and gaming and those things. So anything, when you knowing that for many people, the world is too complex, you can counter that by offering solutions to um, maybe mitigate part of those negative effects. Again, that's an area where depending on the organization, you can find growth in those spaces. And a last example here, and it depends a little bit on the type of products and services that you have, but uh, there's been a tremendous push or tremendous growth area in terms of digital solutions. And for me, the most interesting uh, corner here is anything that happens to or it happens with um, the older generations. And for me, it's not uh, 80 year old, 80 year olds. You, you see people, um, let's say, let's say uh, people above 50, many of them were of course already digitally connected. They uh, were using smartphones already but most of them only with very limited use cases. They might browse for information. Um, many of them never actually used e-commerce solutions. And in the last few months, uh, in many regions, those older generations have now uh, tried uh, online banking. They tried online shopping. They created a lot of new accounts and video conferencing tools. So many of those people became far more um, uh, literate uh, in the use of digital solutions and they, they build trust that it actually works and it creates convenience for them. That creates a great solution now if you're, that creates great opportunity because many companies wouldn't design custom solutions that would offer a digital service to older generations because most of the pre-pandemic, pre uh, often that market was way too small or uh, a niche service, but today you know that those people are now connected and are more familiar with those services and they're open to try new things as well. So depending on the platform or the services that you have, it's, it's worth now looking at old generations as well to access them via digital channels, which traditionally you wouldn't do or you would felt like it's a little bit too niche and it's not exciting enough or has not enough potential. So that's a third example. And depending on the company, there are some uh, elements for growth in that area as well. Of course, if you start looking at all the ripple effects and all the different industries, you will find some numerous examples. There are uh, dozens of those cases popping up or different trends and white spaces uh, emerging. These are just a couple of examples of things that are happening. Um, 
uh, in the Q and A, we can uh, quickly discuss maybe more specific industries or more other general trends. So I'm, of course, I'm, I'm available for uh, other questions. I'll make sure you get all the slides. So this is just a quick teaser of information. We try to redo regular report, do regular reports. Uh, if you want to connect, you feel free to reach out on LinkedIn as well and keep an eye on the, the different blog posts and stories and webinars that we do uh, about specific industries uh, as well. So that was just a quick uh, summary. Um, you can ask some questions in, in chat or we can also debate this uh, here in person. So thanks uh, already. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, I know we asked you to slow down, but there was so much information in such a short space of time. Uh, I'm sure people are still digesting. Uh, there's a great deal of condensed information in your presentation. And I always just find every time I see the material, I kind of take more away and I think of other things. So what I'd like to ask people uh, to do is to please put your questions in the chat for us. There are a couple of things people are asking, some very specific things about specific industries. And there was a question uh, from, I think, Samson, who asked about the future of commercial property, if you had any thoughts on where you thought uh, commercial property might go, uh, given, given this kind of, you know, change. Yeah, that's, a, that's, an, interesting, uh, that's an interesting area, because you see there's a, it links to the, sometimes links to safety issues, like certain areas people are not willing to go back, like uh, malls and retail places or cinemas and the, all the complexes that are linked to that, so people might avoid that. And the commercial services that are in there uh, might not feel comfortable to restart your business knowing that there's not enough foot traffic and probably the biggest shift is anything that links to uh, working from home and the impact there. Uh, for, for us, we rather look at this on a on like a city level. So there are regions in, in like San Francisco or New York or where many people, the, the prices were already really high or like Amsterdam region where the prices were really high and you already see that the first big organizations are starting to move away Canceling leases, re, uh, restarting, uh, reconsidering their options. To um, so, um, I think there will be in those big commercial places. Unfortunately, I think there will be a very negative uh, impact. But I will not overstate it. Like this is a, a global trend in every different region. It's for me, it's, it links more to those uh, tech hubs or areas where there are a lot of people are able to work remote. Just I think for many people, they are like I also said, like many people cannot rely on remote work and digital connections. So there's a lot of debate like this is not the future of work and everybody will switch, switch to video and even AR and VR. Uh, but many of us are living in this bubble, like me as well. We're living in this bubble. I'm at home. I have all this set up to do video conferencing. And this is my reality. But in, in rea most people out there are working in other environments and they will not move away. They will go back to factories. They will go back to the, their regular retail jobs. And now all that property will remain at, at similar uh, um, will, will be used in a very similar uh, way. So you will see the stories also, I, I think it's a little bit over, um, I think impact is a little bit, um, people overestimate the impact here because also journalists are in that position, they're living in this bubble, they can work remotely, they will overestimate the impact on society that many people will start working from home and also the property will need to be resold or can't be used anymore. But I think, I think it will be limited to certain regions or certain cities. It's not a global trend, I believe. Sure, Nick. and I guess uh, also what we're seeing in South Africa is quite a big um, swing. People with cash are buying a property at the moment. There's, a, there's been a slight spike in the property market. So perhaps the bigger players are thinking ahead to your point and uh, taking advantage of the kind of economy so they can buy up more property. Um, yep. It's going to be an interesting space once it's, the dust has settled, let's say. Um, yep. Another question here from Petri uh, asks about the petrochemical industry. Um, quite interesting, the future of transport, perhaps, in heavy industry. That's a, yeah, here the impact is often more, less linked to the pandemic itself, but more to uh, uh, the tensions that are created in terms of ripple effects uh, due to nationalism, geopolitics, and how, yeah, basically the uh, different banks are also almost gambling with, with uh, or gambling or trying new solutions to provide cash and liquidity in, in the market. So you see more, I see less the impact on, on the pandemic itself. And you see that um, in terms of, let's say the transport business and logistics uh, is actually growing quite well. Like the people are still transporting a lot of goods and in terms of private logistics as well. Transport, if you look at reason in China, uh, personal travel and car usage is up, uh, is up all even more at uh, you know, up at the same levels or even more. You see traffic congestions 
and it's, it's back because people flock back to their cars. They're avoiding public transport. They're, um, people see their car as a safe personal bubble to travel in. So uh, many parts that are defined to, to um, like links to like the fuel and anything in that space might be actually back at relative high levels. Doesn't mean like a full recovery, but it's not, uh, it will not be impacted as severely as a, I took the pandemic itself as severely as many people will, will see. There are many parts of, of our economy that are using those services or products that are actually growing rather quick, based probably uh, mostly based on what we see already in, uh, in China. Uh, but it depends a little bit more about geopolitics and national tensions, and it might create unusual ripple effects that are less linked to, to the pandemic. But overall in society, different regions, there is so much tension in the market that it might have a, take a quick turn as well, but I don't think linked to the pandemic, but more to geopolitics in that case. Yeah, perhaps also the, the rise in uh, online commerce, that's gotta be delivered. The logistics are still huge, and yeah. so there's a great deal of demand there as well. Uh, so Lawrence asked an interesting question, he said that um, Lawrence is in risk management and uh, delivering services on behalf of insurance companies, and he says that you mentioned that that was one of the growth areas. Um, he's asking how he could perhaps modify or enhance his company value proposition to match the new normal. Uh, in, anything linked to insurance and risk management, that's uh, for me an interesting area because I, I assume and our team assume there's so many growth options there because like I said, people feel there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. So when there's pe when people are uncertain or also companies there's so much uncertainty, then you see that people are flocking more to insurances or new type of insurance products. Anything, any service that helps to mitigate risk is actually a good solution today. People are typically buying more of those things. Another elements here, which I think it's an interesting almost the, the, a negotiation position or, or left that can create leverage. Uh, insurers and players in that same field, and everybody involved in risk management, they hold the key to restart the economy and society because if, um, if they are not willing to uh, cover the risk, which let's say in, let's say in tourism, if, if, you're, if you're opening up hotels and all services and, and regions, but nobody's willing to cover that insurance, then it can't be restarted because people know an extreme example here, but the um, Emirates Airlines now recently they announced a new COVID insurance product and it will cover your funeral when you travel with them and you might unfortunately get sick and die in the in unfortunate event. They cover your funeral. So it's a, it's a specifically designed COVID service, also your cost linked to uh, being in a quarantine position. But this, of course, linked closely to the pandemic, but there are many new services that are, I would say, again, if people are working. Um, if people are working uh, remotely and you get sick at home and anything happens in your private environment while but you're still actually at work. So many insurance and risk management products need to be redesigned to accommodate for this low touch environment. So the governments and insurers and anything and everybody involved in space holds the key to actually open up the economy. So that's interesting to see how they're, who's taking the risk here, who's taking forward. And then the governments will probably uh, help out that it's not only the responsibility of those companies. Uh, so it's interesting combination here, how they will collaborate. Okay, um, uh, John, I wanted to bring you in just quickly because I noticed early on in, in uh, well, about halfway through the presentation, uh, Nick mentioned some stuff about the rise of inequality. And I know, John, that you've uh, spoken a lot uh, and written a lot about the, the shocking Gini coefficient in South Africa. And um, I wanted to ask if you could maybe both share some thoughts on, on, on that's a very real uh, problem for South Africa, particularly, it's an immediate problem. Uh, John, your thoughts on, on how the Gini coefficient may be affected the wrong way after this? Well, it's, it could be disastrous because we have the worst Gini coefficient in the world, meaning we've got more money trapped in the fewest hands and least money trapped in the most. So we've got, we're having the people who are suffering are the people at the um, poor end mainly because they're not getting their jobs, they're not getting their pay, they're getting some subsidies, they're getting food subsidies, but their permanent employment prospects are challenged as well. Now, I'm not a, cat a catastrophizer at all. I tend to uh, not get much pleasure out of describing those things. I instinctively force myself to think, what are the solutions? And so I think the solutions here um, are that we've got to start changing. I mean, Nick's point on risk is massively important. You know, what the government does to, to support that. Helping people with their subsidies is massively important. But in the longer term, we've got to get education and skills to people because it's skills that give freedom, not wealth. You know, so we have to um, push out internet connectivity across the country. We've got to invest in that. We've got to branch, um, breach the digital divide. We've got to get education to people. That's not going to solve it in the next six months, but actually within two years it will. We can skill up people within a year and to get the infrastructure in. 
Um, and then we've got to do a lot of work in terms of changing the way we think of South Africa. Uh, this is a long haul we're into now. So um, companies have got to change the way they think about their capitalist models in terms of just profiteering and Milton Friedman, you know, stakeholder capitalism. We've now got to think um, about how do we, or shareholder capitalism, we've got to think about how do we help develop the, those parts of the economy that are just untouched. But that is where our future lies. So one good thing from this is it's getting people to understand that we are all connected in such a way. And I think Nick's presentation is enormously helpful to force us to think about the consequences and to just stare reality in the face and, and, and start making plans. Thanks, yeah. I, I thought it'd be good just to bring you in because you're more familiar with the South African context than maybe Nick's had a chance to. I know you've got quite a lot of research on South Africa, Nick, but I know John's been involved. Um, Junaid is asking a, a quite interesting question. He's talking about the fact in your uh, low touch, low value um, um, the move, uh, low touch, low value. He just wants to know more about low, low touch, high value, um, you know, as, a, as an opportunity. And he just wants to expand, if you could expand a little on that. What was the last uh, sentence on it, low touch? Just, uh, just to dive into low touch and high value. Ah, yeah, yes. So um, low touch and high value. So this is basically, so that's the, the corner where uh, most of the time it's, it's a, an acceleration of digital solutions, but you see that companies that uh, were never used to, to, to offer work services remotely. They had not the service in-house. So one of the trends or consequence things that I assume there will be more products designed to uh, like professional tools, but then designed to be used uh, at home. Um, so it's not just about video conferencing. You can see, uh, let's say, certain uh, lab setups for uh, people are working in medical uh, areas. Normally that they have all this very advanced equipment that is locked in a lab or a, a medical facility remotely. But you see that people and also news anchors and many people, they, they rely on very professional equipment. They need more equipment than a laptop. And they just took a lot of that stuff at home or to a remote location to work remotely. Uh, and you see that those products and, and services linked to that were never designed uh, for that use case. So, and also services, I mean, uh, say cybersecurity services to make sure that data is being protected, even if you're working from remote somewhere. So you see there's, uh, if you move in that corner for, okay, it's low touch interaction, so maybe a limited amount of people or from a distance, but you don't have the right professional gear to do that. It's more than a webcam and a couple of lights. Uh, then you need new type of services that can accommodate, accommodate for that new reality. Uh, so I expect in the year ahead, there will be more products that are designed for that. There are, it could be as, as basic as products that are, um, that are more easier to carry or they can put in your car or that multiple people can connect remotely. Also the cybersecurity layer is being covered. Maybe an insurance product is linked to that. If you use it remotely, it's being covered if something breaks down, whatever. So you see companies are, in the first day they were everybody improvising. People just took a lot of stuff from factories and companies to, to do that. And now companies are like, okay, for the next year, two years, we might allow more remote work, but then you need better tools at home. You might even invest in your home solution or local co-working space. You can work with more professional gear. So it's not just about digital solutions online because a lot of stuff is happening there. It's for me, it's also the providing offline solutions with hardware products and tools that are designed for that uh, use case, not just digital webcams and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point because I see um, um, uh, Samson has asked about the FANG grouping of companies. Um, and we all know that, you know, they've been kind of perfecting low touch and high value for quite some time. So they're very geared towards that. Whereas people are just getting started now, it, don't realize it's about layers. There are layers of, of, of this kind of development. It's not about going digital. I don't know what that means anymore, actually. What does going digital mean? It doesn't mean getting a ring light and a, you know, and a, and a, and a, and a high-speed connection to your point. So there's been massive investment over a long time by the people at the, you know, who are acquiring most of the value because they've been doing low touch at lower cost and then delivering high value. Amazon is a good example, and um, maybe not so much Apple because they <laughs> they are very very high price. But uh, but it's it's interesting. So I um yeah I, I think Jeanette, you know um you've got to look at what how you invest in in in, in low touch first. Um I, I think that's yeah, very very important. Yeah. Yeah, John, maybe you can speak a bit about um, how, um, how you've done that with Henley. Yes, I mean, I'll, I'll briefly talk about Henley. Um, we, we were quite aware anyway, and, and uh, luckily, um, I suppose we, 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 we are quite conscious of what's going on around us, by, we, and we look for people like you, Nick, 
who will tell us what's going on. So we're, we're quite stretchy in terms of getting out to people. So we learned about this early in February and we managed to prepare and get ourselves online quickly. But a lot of that was about good situational awareness and not running away from fear. Um, nobody really wanted, none of us wanted to believe this was going to happen and none of us really want to believe that it's going to be quite difficult over the next year or two. So I believe in facing reality and making reality your friend. So we were able to convert, get completely online. We're setting up new businesses, but it's a huge learning process for us. We don't feel clever in having done that. We'll feel just stretched and we're, we're pushing ourselves. It, it's hard and there's lots of emotion and challenge in people doing that. So for me, I think what preoccupies me, and particularly in terms of South Africa, is that we've got, obviously, we're suffering in our economy and we're gonna be feeling that over the next year or two. It may or may not strengthen the government, but what do we as business schools and what do we as companies do? It's no good being fatalistic and nihilistic. We've got to make changes. Um, so I think the models you're sharing are extremely useful to help us think. How would you, Nick, how would you get to a board or a group of leaders? How would you approach them and get them to shift to see these realities in the way that you think are, are appropriate? How would you get to them? Often, uh, the larger the company, often the more assurance that things will work. So it, that the more innovative or experimental you want to do, they want to get at least some proof that things could work out. Uh, that's typical how it goes in any type of innovation project. Uh, Luckily, in this situation, uh, everybody around the globe is experimenting at the same time. So it creates, an, uh, if you want to try something new, you can look, okay, what's happening already in this space now in Israel or what are doing in Vietnam or in Asia. Or, so there are, there are certain regions that are a little bit ahead of the curve. So meaning that companies in the business in that environment have already experimented and tried so many things. So if you want to try something new, most of the time you'll find similar companies or adjacent companies that are, that are starting to do similar experiments. And by showing those examples, how other companies have failed already, what they've tried, what worked, it helps to get people on board in a large organization because still today, and I, I totally get it, people are risk averse. Uh, there's so much uncertainty. So they, they want extra proof that things could work out. That's probably also a reason why you see that typically the larger companies are not willing to take tremendous risks now to launch new products or to try new business models, even if they are under enormous pressure. They want to protect what they have, defend, and maybe wait it out a little bit. The good thing is there are so many experiments ongoing that you can look what works to see what patterns are emerging and then maybe copy some of those elements to your own space. So that's something what we try to do to, uh, in terms of analogy thinking, to show other patterns in other industries it creates a little bit more reassurance and more confidence for companies that actually to move forward and to, to try new things. So that's a little bit the positive thing that at least you have more examples out there. If you do a traditional innovation project, it might sometimes be very difficult to find our experiments out there to give that extra reassurance to companies to, to go forward. Thank you. So, yeah, um, so, so Nick, I think because we, I think we're coming to the end of our time, but um, uh, I wanted to ask you. You mentioned earlier, front there was an audacious vision for a board of innovation to, to try and uh, assist. Uh, I think it was a hundred million people, was it? Um, um, yep. within, within your time frame. So, so that's that's an incredible vision because if you you are speaking about collaboration, you're speaking about um, helping and spreading something perhaps virally because it, you know at scale, it's got to, it's got to move really quickly. Um, that's a very interesting idea. How, how do people become involved in, in what it is that you're trying to do and spreading this innovation? How, how, how do people contribute in it towards this kind of mission? Yeah, what, what we try to do in that continuously, we, we try to create tools, frameworks, uh, all sorts of material that we make freely available on our websites. So of course we have our purely commercial activities where we collaborate with large multinationals on innovation projects, but all the things that we do, the, the material that we create, many of those things, we just document that online and we give that to people away for free. And now we see that people are using our tools and knowledge in different environments. Sometimes they might they collaborate together with us, maybe to redesign a tool or framework to that we can give uh, feedback. But we just, you now we create a starting point, we create a new material, new context, and we give it away for free. So people use it. That's something we do now for more than 10 years. And we just see like, if we, over the lifetime of Board of Innovation, if we assume that we'll not quit next year, uh, we assume that we aim to have reach 100 million people uh, with all that material and tools to help people out. And for me, the, although our commercial offering is a little bit more focused on multinationals and large organizations, we even see that people in a very different environment, like we get uh, people in Venezuela, 
just as an example where you know in society there's so much pressure and people need to organize themselves so how do we uh, collaborate together just to get our society back up and running and then again they use our tools and frameworks to create a common vision to find a strategy to to create collaborations there so it's not linked in any way in terms of commercial uh, in a commercial project but of course it gives us a lot of uh, positive feedback that we can help out even in those very tough environments where people can use our knowledge and tools to organize themselves so that's the reason why we keep doing those things just to share what we what we see and it, it seems to help other people out there. So that's nice to see. Cool, so I think that's a brilliant place to bring it to a close. We're just talking about the fact that sharing seems to be one of the fastest ways to spread innovation as opposed to competing or as opposed to doing it for yourself, self-service. It just seems to hinder progress. And at a time when we need lots of innovation very quickly, uh, it's interesting that when, when instinctively you wanna close your hand, what you should be doing is opening it. Uh, to raise the tide. So, so Nick, thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple of requests for your um, presentation on the chat. Um, I think a lot of people loved it. They just need a bit of time to, uh, uh, to digest uh, the information. I know certainly we've spent some time digesting a lot of what you're putting out because it's been really useful to us uh, working through the COVID and, and beneficial. So thank you so much. Uh, John, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, Professor Jonas, thank you for joining us. And thanks for um, arranging the series. I think it's, it's a really good way to spend an hour. Crisp, powerful, uh, lots of takeaway information. And of course, the recording uh, and the presentation will be available so you can get the maximum uh, benefit. Just a couple of quick notes. Um, the first one is the next webinar will be um, hosted by uh, uh, Sapsa and Gibbs, the APSA Group Chief Executive Engineering Services, uh, and Dr. Morris Mtombeni will host. So that should be good. That's on the 9th of September, 9 to 10 a.m. You can register on any of the um, sets of online platforms. Uh, please tell other people. That would be amazing. Uh, very good. And then, of course, at the end of this webinar, an evaluation form will pop up. If you fill that in, there's a good chance these will get better in the way that you like them. Nick, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, I hope this has been useful. And, uh, and then I, I'm aware of the fact that uh, it's, it's half past 12. Many people are on a schedule. So, um, so thank you all for joining us. And until next time, uh, keep safe. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye.